Hello everyone, uh, this is Aurindam Ghosh again back with another video on Marxism. This is perhaps my uh, fourth lecture on Marxism. And uh, previously, uh, in the past three lectures, I have discussed about the basic principles of Marxism, some of the basic doctrines of the classical Marxism, uh, doctrines like uh, that of the historical materialism, uh, dialectic materialism, uh, Marxist conception of the state, Marxist criticism of the capitalism, and of course how uh, this entire evolution of the history uh, 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 is occurring in human civilization through the four, four stages. Uh, I have uh, in a detailed way discussed about that. I have also talked about how some innate contradictions actually uh, give birth to the next stage of the history. I have also discussed about the significance of the proletarian revolution in classical Marxism. Uh, in this present lecture, as I have said, I will discuss about some of the basic principles of the Marxist literary criticism, uh, classical Marxist literary criticism rather. I will discuss the impact of the uh, culture studies and post-Marxism and the uh, uh, post-Gramscian studies later in this lecture. Uh, and. Uh, uh, more elaborately, I will talk about the historical and political aspects of uh, the later Marxism, that is from Leninism. Though perhaps this portion will not be so much relevant for your examination purpose, but it is necessary. Uh, I think it is uh, uh, very much necessary uh, in order to contextualize the history of the Marxism. And uh, uh, so that you can relate Marxist literary theory uh, with the uh, uh, with the political scenario of the contemporary uh, history, without which uh, the reading of the Marxism will not complete. Because, as I have said, that Marxism is not uh, is a kind of theoretical foundation or theoretical tool. Uh, it meant uh, to be applied, and you should relate. Uh, the political history of the Europe up to uh, 1990s, without which uh, your reading of the Marxism uh, will remain incomplete. So, let us uh, begin this lecture uh, by talking about the basic principles of the Marxist literary criticism. So, uh, Marxist literary criticism is actually the belief that literature basically reflects the class struggle and the materialistic conception of history. As I have already said that Marx strongly believed on the notion of the base and the superstructure and he always talks about the economic base and uh, the political and cultural superstructure. So technically literature belongs to the superstructure part of classical Marxism, orthodox Marxism. So for Marx, Karl Marx, though uh, Marx uh, 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 loved lit reading literature very much, but literature does not hold a very important significant place in a Marxist criticism. Because uh, according to Karl Marx, it is the materialistic idea of the history, it is the economic power, uh, it is the dominance of the economy that actually controls everything in Marxist theory. But Marxist literary criticism will always uh, look into the history of the class struggle, uh, the history of uh, the economic power and it looks at how literature functions in relation to the other aspects of the superstructure, particularly articulations of other forms of ideologies like uh, that of the social class, like uh, that of the gender. Uh, and of course, uh, the influence of the capitalist society uh, and how uh, social realism is being portrayed through literature. So, Marxist literary criticism is very much concerned, especially with the portrayal of social realism. Shamajik Bastovata, Orthonoitik Avostar Bornona, Kirakumabe Shamaje Ghorche. Tar at a proper description, Hochekina, Shed a Marxist literary criticism, Shopshomai Dakhe, and definitely it promotes the idea that literature should be a tool in the revolutionary struggle because it attempts to clarify the relationship of the literary work 
to the social reality. And according to a Marxist literary criticism, of course, literature should be uh, political in nature and it aims to arrive at an interpretation of the literary text in order to define the political dimensions, the social dimensions of the literary work. So without a proper social and political dimension, a literary work uh, is not a great form of art according to the Marxist literary criticism. So as we all know that Marx himself was a voracious reader who uh, read across the multiple languages and as a young man uh, he in fact composed a poetry as well as an unfinished, unfinished novel and fragments of a play. But throughout Marx's life Marx was very much uh, intrigued with economy uh, and he was very much concerned with the base because uh, he was organizing a political movement not a cultural movement so marx was very much concerned with the uh, with the with the means of production with the relations of production the things that belong to the base uh, the the infrastructure of the society so in fact uh, marx in a particular passage in his grand Rees, uh, talked about uh, the problem of an apparent discrepancy between economic and artistic development. Marx said that the Greek tragedy is considered a peak of literary development and yet it coincides with a social system and a form of ideology, that is the Greek myth, which are no longer valid and relevant for the modern society. So the problem of Marx was to explain how an art and literature produced in a long and obsolete social organization can still give us aesthetic pleasure and be regarded as a standard and unattainable ideal. So Marx didn't believe on the notion of the art for art sake. Literature for merely seeking pleasure. Only for writing literature, uh, manusher emotion, manusher living uh, the probity, uh, tar reflection, the literature, hote pare, among Shadavata, Utunta Gurtopun no Jinish, a uh, human emotional container of literature. Shaita Marx, Ponodini, recognize Korani, the Karanach, the current Marxist philosophy, Komodin, uh, either on emotion, uh, recognize Korena, Hoyta Kore, Kintu, either on emotion ke recognize kore le, a Marxist philosophy je core structural elements she gulo khodik gross to hote pare among shet essentially uh, uh, the priority by uh, the representation of the social and uh, political predicament she gai to Marx er at a uttum to important bakhto bere boi shishto by Marx er literary criticism mer modhyo shomaj babosta shomaj bhabna orthonoitik abosta especially the economic uh, predicament of the working class people, the description of the proletarian revolution, Egulo Ottonto Gurutapuna Bhumika Palon Kore. So, uh, moving uh, into the uh, Marxism and the cultural criticism, uh, if we uh, try to provide the theory of the industrialist society, Marx and Engels also actually treated art as an important component of the human culture but however their main contribution was to locate this so-called aesthetic realm such as art within the context of the politics economics and history as i'm saying that the main aim of the marx uh, is to locate the aesthetic realms within the context of the politics economics and history and the marxist approach to literature always questions the aesthetics often therefore links them with the questions of class and economic conditions of power. So uh, this linking of the arts with uh, the economic uh, ability of the people, the linking of the culture with the social and sociological and political uh, 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 aims and objectives of human life becomes a very uh, basic foundation of Marxist literary criticism. That's uh, the impact of the Marxist. 
that's uh, the impact of the Marxism uh, across the world because it's a global map uh, that actually depicts uh, uh, those countries which declare themselves to be socialist states under the Marxist, Leninist or Maoist definition between 1979 to 1983. You can see almost one third of the global population has actually converted itself to Marxism. So, uh, this is uh, the entire uh, map of the world. You can see, uh, for example, countries like USSR, Russia, countries like uh, the China, uh, Mongolia, the various other uh, uh, African countries, Madagascar and others, have converted themselves into uh, Marxist uh, thought, Marxist political thought. So you can see how powerful uh, Marxist philosophy is that it has the potential to convert almost one third of the world's people uh, towards uh, the political ideology of Marxism. So uh, uh, from this very picture you can recognize the importance of this political doctrine. Talking about the legacy of Marxism, the influence of Marxism, uh, I must say that in the political realm, uh, the interpretation of Marxism occurs in various ways and uh, uh, it reflected itself, expressed itself through various uh, other ideologies which can be described as the offshoots of the Marxism. For example, Leninism is another offshoot of Marxism, Marxism-Leninism, Trotskyism, we will discuss about Leon, uh, Lionel Trotsky uh, later about and Maoism, Luxembourgism, uh, Stalinism, they are all part of the Marxism. Of course, uh, structural Marxism, historical Marxism, uh, uh, analytical Marxism, uh, Hegelian Marxism, phenomenological Marxism, these uh, various academic school of the Marxism also uh, are can be described as the uh, part and parcel and legacy bearers of Marxist thought. And uh, from an academic perspective, Marxist work contributed to the modern sociology, to the birth of the modern sociology, and he has been cited as one of the 19th century's three masters of the school of the suspicion, as I have already mentioned, alongside Friedrich Nietzsche and Sigmund Freud, Karl Marx is actually considered as one of the uh, birth makers of the modernist philosophy. So, uh, along with uh, Emil Durkheim and Max Weber, he is also considered as one of the architects of the modern social science. This is uh, uh, a monument of Marx and Friedrich Engels, uh, 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 located in uh, Berlin, Germany. Politically, Marx's legacy is uh, perhaps more complex. Throughout the 20th century, revolutions in the dozens of countries labeled themselves as Marxist and most notably the Russian Revolution, uh, especially uh, uh, major world leaders including Vladimir Lenin, Mao Zedong, Fidel Castro, uh, Salvador Allende, Joseph Brons Tito, uh, Nelson Mandela and others, they have all cited Marx as a major influence. Now uh, I'll end the classical Marxism and we'll begin talking about uh, the second international which is a very important incident and from this particular incident uh, the birth of another famous uh, political leader will be declared in Marxism and he is Vladimir Elich Lenin. So first international was a political organization of the workers uh, union. In the second international uh, is actually uh, a, a kind of uh, workers organization and this organization of the leftist socialist labor parties founded in Paris in 1889. It was actually after the death of the Marx. It was founded by Engels and others and uh, far more successful than the first international, most famous for international campaign for 8 hour working day. It talks about 8 hour working day and it dissolved during the World War I in 1914 with the birth of uh, another very important Marxist thinker, Vladimir Elich Lenin. 
So Lenin, a Lydian Russian Marxist, recognized that the Second International had achieved something in establishing political consciousness in helping the workers' groups to organize themselves. But he said that we needed a real revolutionary international body. And so I founded the Third International or Comintern in March 1919. The Third Communist International known as Comintern uh, was an international organization that advocated the world communism. Because Comintern resolved at its second congress to struggle by all available means, including armed force, the overthrow of the international bourgeois, and the creation of an international Soviet Republic as a transition stage to the complete abolition of the state. So, in the third international, Lenin for the first time declared about the, uh, uh, the birth of the uh, United Russia or the birth of the Soviet Union. Uh, he dreamt of, at least, uh, uh, about this country in the Third Communist International. So let us have a look into the very colorful uh, uh, and uh, revolutionary life of Vladimir Lenin. Vladimir Lenin, 1870-1924. His real name was Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, alias Lenin. He was a Russian revolutionary, a politician, a great scholar, and at the same time, a political theorist. He applied Marxism in the practical domain. He served as the head of the government of the Soviet Russia from 1917, the year of the Bolshevik Revolution, to 1924, and the Soviet Union from 1922 to 1924. And under his administration, Russia and then wider Soviet Union became a one-party communist state governed by the Russian Communist Party Ideologically a Marxist, he developed a variant of the Marxism known as Leninism and his notion of uh, our interpretation of Marxist thinking completely changed uh, the Marxist uh, uh, philosophy to a great extent in the later years. So if you remember that uh, Russia has actually a history of revolutionary thought and activity that begins from the 19th century. Unishotok Thekei, Russia and Mudda, Biblavatok, Chinta Bhavna, Potom Thekei Chilo. George Plekanov, P.B. Axelrod, and uh, Vera, uh, uh, Vera uh, Jalusovich, uh, Jal uh, 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 they established a Marxist group called the Emancipation Labor. And uh, uh, they have established the, the group, uh, this, this particular group. Uh, 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 in Switzerland because they were all exiles and uh, Likhanov predicted that soon uh, uh, capitalism uh, will be growing in Russia but from this uh, capitalism uh, uh, a, a kind of offshoot of revolution will also born and Lenin prepared this form of revolution uh, from, 19, from 1893 1985 in these years. Vladimir Elich Lenin was the man, as I am constantly saying, who for the first time applied Marxist thought, Marxist political thought into an actual political field where he overthrown a very powerful government like that of the Tsarist aristocracy. Remember that he established on 16th of April 1917, he established a provisional government in the Russia along with other uh, communist and socialist parties after organizing two successful revolutions. One is the October Revolution and another is of course the uh, immediate predecessor of the October Revolution, the February Revolution. So by organizing two back-to-back -back revolutions, he has overthrown the Tsarist aristocracy autocracy in Russia. It's a hereditary autocracy which ensures the divine right of the king because according to the Tsarist Russia, king is chosen by the god and not by the people, backed by the nobility, the religious institutions like church, the civil service, the police and the armed forces. The Tsarist autocracy is truly a formidable force in Russia and there was no parliament or any democratic 
institution in Russia to stop the Tsarist autocracy. So Marx for the first time formed and uh, become a very important part of the Marxist Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, RSDLP. And after the ideological split, split of the RSDLP, uh, uh, he actually led, uh, become, become a leader of the Bolshevik Party, uh, uh, counterpoint uh, standing against Julius Martov's uh, Menshevik Party. So he encouraged the insurrection during Russia's failed revolution of 1905, but later he organized two successful revolutions and formed the government. Now, at this stage, I must say, uh, another, uh, uh, introduce another person who also plays a very important role in, uh, uh, in the Marxist uh, Leninist Russia, and he is Leon Trotsky, 1879 to 1940, another very important commander of the Red Army, another uh, uh, practitioner of Marxism, uh, who said that uh, the split was never healed and the Bolsheviks increasingly became a separate party from the Mensheviks. Trotsky is a person who though was very close to Lenin, he believed on the notion of the permanent revolution and unlike the Mensheviks, he believed that there could and should be no cooperation with the bourgeois and that the power had to be seized by the urban proletariat. And unlike Lenin, Trotsky believed uh, and he had no expectation of an eventual union between the proletariat and the peasants. He believed on the conception of the permanent revolution, the idea that revolution in Russia can only be sustained if accompanied by revolutions in other developed industrial states. So there was, of course, a flavor of the international communism. Communism is the antorjatik antorjatik communism ke shongothi to korar je ekta prochesta communism er je kono border thakbe na borderless communism desh kal patro phule je shobai ekta ekta equal state toiri korar chesta korbe tar kotha kintu ei trotsky er permanent revolution er totter moddhe khub bhoyongkor hobe paoa jay trotsky took part in the 1917 october revolution and immediately becoming a leader within the communist party he was the founder and commander of the red army this Raid army has been accused of conducting many murders, terrors uh, throughout the uh, inter Russia and various other forms of uh, criminal activities. But after the rise of the Joseph Stalin, uh, Trotsky was removed from all positions in the Communist Party. Uh, uh, he has been eventually expelled from Russia, Soviet Union. Uh, in 1929 and spent the rest of his life in exile and was assassinated in 1940 in the Mexico City by Ramon Markadar, a Soviet agent. Trotsky is important for us because he wrote a brilliant book known as Literature and Revolution. I really don't know a commander of a raid army, a trained military man, how he got his time to compose such a brilliant work on literature and revolution. It's a classic work of literary criticism from the Marxist standpoint, published in 1924. And by discussing the various literary trends that were around in Russia between the revolutions of 1905 and 1917, Trotsky analyzed the concrete forces in the society, both progressive as well as reactionary, that helped shape the consciousness of the writers at the time. In this book, Trotsky explained that since the dawn of the civilization, art had always borne the stamp of the ruling class and was primarily a vehicle that expressed its tastes and sensibilities. So he declared that literature should separate itself from the bourgeois people. Uh, it should be a tool of the proletariat. It's a landmark survey, literature and revolution, it's a landmark survey of the entire Russian literary terrain from 1905 to uh, 1917. So, uh, though in the literature and revolution in his attack on the Russian formalists, Trotsky considered that literature had its own principles and rules. He recognized this and he said that artistic creation is a changing and a transformation of the reality in accordance with the peculiar laws of the art. 
He recognized the peculiarity of the art, that art is unique, art is peculiar. And he still insists that the reality remains the crucial factor and not the formal games which writers play. But he still emphasized on the importance of realism. This is uh, two famous pictures. It's a Polish poster uh, depicting uh, Leon Trotsky uh, on a pile of the skulls and holding a bloody knife. Uh, portraying his role uh, uh, as a commander of the Red Army during the Polish-Soviet War of 1920. And this is the picture of uh, Trotsky, Kalinin and Stalin. It is Kalinin, it is Stalin wearing the coffin of Felix uh, Zarzinski in 30th July 1926. Trotsky can be seen over Kalinin's left shoulder. And later on, this very person will uh, expel Trotsky from the Russia and will eventually uh, employ a murderer, an executioner, to kill him. Trotsky organized the Fourth International, a very important revolutionary socialist international organization. After the Third International, perhaps it is the last international that was organized in France in 1938. Later, he has been murdered in the Mexico City for organizing this kind of campaign. Coming back to Lenin, a Russian civil war actually changed the landscape of the Tsarist Russia. 1917 to 1922, uh, the two largest combatant groups were the Red Army fighting for the Bolshevik uh, and as well as the White Army, the loosely allied forces of the White Army. Uh, it actually gave Russia the freedom. The two very important revolutions, the February Revolution of 1917, resulted in the abdication of the Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. As a result, Russian provisional government was established by Prince uh, uh, Gregory Lavov and the Soviet's elected councils of the workers, soldiers and peasants. Later, it led to the October Revolution, uh, not contended with the provisional government in Russia. Uh, they, uh, uh, the Lenin and the Bolsheviks uh, organized the, uh, the October Revolution and uh, uh, after the ending of the October Revolution, uh, the Bolsheviks soon established a democratic government in Russia. But Lenin's Bolshevik government, though initially shared power with the left socialist revolutionaries, uh, elected Soviets and uh, others, they soon established the Communist Party and Lenin's administration redistributed land among the peasantry and nationalized banks and large kill industries. Uh, Russia flourished under his regime, but there is an acquisition that Lenin uh, has actually uh, uh, eroded all forms of democratic institutions, all forms of democratic forums in the Russia. And his administration defeated the right and the left wing and the anti-Bolshevik armies in the Russian Civil War. And through the Red Army, uh, they have suppressed uh, a, uh, uh, all the opposition voices. And a violent campaign administered by the state security forces actually uh, ends all other forms of uh, democratic governance. This is uh, actually a picture of the Red Terror and uh, a propaganda poster in, Pe in Petrograd. This particular picture of the Red Terror shows that death to the bourgeois and its lap dogs long live the Red Terror. Many said that a Red Terror was a period of political repression and mass killings carried out by Bolsheviks after the beginning of the Russian Civil War in 1918. Many compared this form of mass genocide with uh, the Hitler's Germany. So, uh, the, usually the term is applied to the Bolshevik political repression during the civil war from 1917 to 1922. So, you can see there was always a tendency of, uh, of Marxism, which is actually a philosophy of emancipation, freedom and human liberation. There is always a chance of transformation of this philosophy of liberation into an autocratic thought. So, this uh, uh, tendency of transformation of emancipatory thinking into autocratic thought is always embedded inside the idea of the Marxism because remember that Marx himself talked about the dictatorship of the proletariat, the word quote unquote dictatorship. 
was actually there in Marx's original text. Though Marx talks about a form of inclusive governance by including all the capitalists and all the representatives of the society, but the word dictatorship of the proletariat uh, is there and hence uh, throughout history we have seen that all forms of Marxist government has transformed themselves ultimately into a dictatorial government. So, uh, around uh, 1922, Lenin introduced the new economic policy, NEP. It was an economic policy of Soviet Union, uh, uh, which actually uh, 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 tries to incorporate a free market of the capitalism, uh, subjected to, of course, the state control. So, Marxist revolutionary Marxism, uh, revolutionary uh, Lenin's actually introduced another brand of Marxism known as the revolutionary Marxism. And uh, he said that the, the association of the ideas of the Marx and the Lenin came to be known as the Marxism-Leninism, Leninism, a letter propounded by Stalin. And no one else has had their name linked with that of the Marx in, a, in such a serious way like Lenin. So uh, Lenin said that the capitalist system depends on growth and it must have new markets for its products to avoid the problems of the overproduction and declining profits. So it always needs more and more and more cheaper raw materials. Lenin believed that the situation facing Marxists in the early years of the 20th century was significantly different from that on which Marx had based his ideas because capitalism has entered a new stage, that of the imperialism, which Lenin called the highest stage of the capitalism. And Lenin said, I'm quoting Lenin, that imperialism is capitalism in that stage of development in which the domination of the monopoly and finance capital has taken shape, in which the export of the capital has acquired pronounced importance, in which the division of the world by international trusts has begun and when, in which the partition of all the territory of the earth by the greatest capitalist countries has been completed. And he formed his new theory of the international revolution. He foresaw the globalization in its primary stages. And as the concentration of the capital continued and turned into monopolies and cartels, capital would sweep across the world, drawing every country into the system. The monopolies and trusts would divide the world amicably between them and for a time would prosper. But when there is nowhere, nowhere left to expand into, imperialists must begin fighting amongst themselves. Imperialism leads to war. And colonialists will also have to contend with the new proletariat, the toiling masses or the, the, of the backward countries. So this is the last stage of the capitalism beyond which it cannot progress. Revolution must follow and will overthrow the capitalism. So he thought that capitalism's last stage is imperialism. But uh, uh, sadly enough, capitalism still uh, continued itself and it survived by changing uh, the entire framework constantly by resolving its innate contradictions. So Leninism is different from Marxism in the sense that while Marx believed that the proletariat would be urban and industrialized and would rise in rebellion spontaneously, Lenin believed that an agrarian society like Russia can organize a revolution. So not necessarily the industrial proletariat will organize a revolution. So Leninism for the first time actually showed that even an agrarian country like Russia can have the potential to organize a revolution. There are some strong similarities between Marxist and Leninist thought. Marx also thought that the history was the story of the class struggle. At the same time, Lenin also thought that the history is the story of the class struggle. Marx thought that uh, the struggle he saw was between the capitalists and the proletariat or the workers, but Lenin saw that, the, that, that it was a struggle against the capitalists, against the proletariat, as well as the peasants, the agrarian people. The proletariat's numbers would become so great and their conditions so poor 
that a spontaneous revolution would occur, said Marx. But Lenin said a completely different thing, very important, that the proletariat and the peasants were not capable of leading a revolution on their own. And they will eventually need the guidance of the professional revolutionaries, which he called the vanguards, the vanguards of revolution. So here from Lenin propounded his political theory of vanguardism. The Kaukena Kauke profession jetal jara revolutionary jara peshadar biblobi jara biblob korte obhosto onekta peshadar shoiniker moto tader netitte ei agrarian people ei krishokera ebong tar shonge shonge of course the industrialized proletariat jodi tara chay tarao ei biblobe tara aste pare to tara ekmatro ei peshadar biblobi der netritte dite pare so marx said the revolution would end with the dictatorship of the proletariat the communal ownership of the well marx said that revolution will eventually establish communism but lenin said after the revolution the state needed to be run by a single party with disciplined centrally directed administrators in order to ensure its goal the complete ownership of the property and the distribution of the wealth will occur eventually later so lenin is widely considered as one of the significant and influential figures of the 20th century he was a uh, posthumously a subject of a pervasive personality cult throughout the soviet union uh, almost all the continents have the statues of lenin in fact uh, i have discussed with a, a, a friend recently in fact antarctica has a statue of lenin and he became an ideological figure head behind the marxism leninism discourse and thus his prominent influence over the international communist movement he was a champion of socialism and the working class but he was a highly controversial and highly divisive historical figure many accused him of propounding the notion of the dictatorial government lenin's essay party organization and party literature is an important essay in marxist literary criticism party organization and party literature published in 1905 and uh, there he said that that while all the writers were free to write what they liked they could not expect to be published in party journals unless they were committed to the party's political line for example pushkin was uh, uh, many said that he was uh, a poet of the party uh, A, a, a writer of the party and the quality of the narrowness that is popularity is central to both the aesthetics and the politics a work of art of any period achieves this quality by expressing a high level of social awareness revealing a sense of the true social conditions and feelings of a particular epoch so uh, depicting society depicting the social predicament and social realism and the politics Uh, is very important also for lenin in his discussion of the aesthetics so according to lenin aesthetics and politics will go hand in hand together so uh, this is a picture of uh, lenin joseph stalin and mikhail kalinin and after this there occurs the rise of stalinism throughout the entire russia Joseph Stalin born in 1878 died in 1953 a revolutionary a georgian revolutionary and a soviet politician who led the soviet union from the mid 1920s until 1953 he ruled russia for about more than 30 years and he was the general secretary of the communist party of the soviet union and premier of soviet union from 1941 to 1953 this is uh, a picture of joseph stalin an authorized image taken in 1937 used for the state publicity purposes so you can see here a leader with iron purpose uh, there is always the politics of representing stalin as uh, a very firm and very strong and robust leader so the acquisition against marxism acquisition against tra uh, transformation of the uh, democratic principles into a uh, dictatorial principle in marxism uh, can be traced 
in Stalin to a great extent. Though he was a communist, ideologically committed to the Leninist interpretation of Marxism, but later he propounded his own theory of Stalinism. He strongly believed on the state control. According to him, the party, the Communist Party, exercises the dictatorship of the proletariat. This is the basic foundational thought that even propounded by Marx that the Communist Party will exercise the dictatorship of the proletariat. The dictatorship is in the essence of the dictatorship of the of, the, of its vanguard, the party. So uh, not only it's a dictatorship of the proletariat, but also it's a dictatorship of the Communist Party itself. That's actually an interpretation of Stalin himself. And the vanguard of the party, the leader of the party, Stalin. The Soviets' role was secondary to the parties because there was no difference between the constitution of the new state and the rule of the party. So, for the first time, Joseph Stalin himself becomes the face of the Russian constitution. The state and the party and his figure become actually one and the same. Trotsky disagreed with this view, another nail in Trotsky's coffin, and it actually removed Trotsky, first from, the, from uh, Russia and then from the entire world. So Lenin seized his function after strokes in 1922 to 1923. In this particular time, Stalin actually succeeded uh, Lenin's throne. And uh, there are other also competitors like uh, L.B. Kaminev, uh, G.Y. Zinoviev, and Leon Trotsky, and others. But it is Stalin, through his uh, extreme intelligence, that he become the head of the uh, of, of the party, and uh, uh, he at first become the secretary of the Org Bureau, and then of the Politburo, and gradually he removed and actually particularly murdered uh, all his companions uh, after the death of the Lenin. And finally, in 1938, uh, he actually uh, killed Bukharin too. So in the name of the Marxism-Leninism, he established an autocracy in Russia. Equality was abandoned with no hope of, uh, uh, of from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. A clash of the party members emerged who lived in great luxury from the state and had access to special shops. Dictatorship of the proletariat had passed from dictatorship of the party to the dictatorship of the party leader. So uh, he in fact used the Cheka and all the Russian secret services in order to uh, silent uh, the voices of those who were marginalized in order to silence uh, those voices who were raising voices inside the party against Stalin. So Stalin established his cult personality across the globe. This is the poster of the Stalin display at a public event in Leipzig in 1950. The celebration of the Stalin's 70th birthday in the People's Republic of China. Can you believe? So a cult personality of the Stalin has been established. His female members of the FDG carry Stalin's pictures in the Third World Festival of the Youth and Students in the East Berlin. So Stalin actually become a face of the revolution. He has actually transformed himself into a dictator. And naturally, the nature and the constitution of the Russian communist state was set in stone by Lenin and Stalin. And thereafter, it seemed incapable of change or development. The expected revolutions in capitalist Western economies never happened in Russia. Revolutions instead occurred in the developed third world country like China, Cuba, Vietnam, etc. The only other Marxist regimes of the 20th century were those created in the countries seized by Russia at the conclusion of the Second World War. Now, in these Eastern European nations like Poland, East Germany, Czechoslovakia, and elsewhere uh, in the Eastern Bloc, communist regimes were installed in the strict Russian pattern. So, uh, all in the names of the Marx, they exhibited all the familiar Russian feelings of the brutality, suppression, and stagnation. 
So perhaps Marx uh, would say it with more vigor that uh, uh, if he had seen uh, all these things, perhaps he wouldn't have supported it. Many scholars have said. So Stalin's conception of Marxism is essentially uh, an embracing of all form of uh, 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 brutal ending of counter-revolutionary forces. And in fact, uh, the regimes of the Soviet Russia and its Eastern Bloc became isolated, rigid and inward looking. The threat rather than the reality of the world revolution provoked fear and sustained hostility in the Western democratic free world. So an era of the Cold War issued from 1950, which even uh, uh, ran to 1990. Here is another very important member of the Marxist family, the person who changed uh, uh, the topology of Marxism and applied it in the political domain of China. He is Mao Shetung. Here is another person, Fidel Castro, who organized the revolution in Cuba in 1959. Here is another person, Ho Chi Minh, uh, who especially uh, applied the Marxist formula in Vietnam. So, especially the name of the Mao Zedong is very much prominent here. He is the founding head and the father fickle of the People's Republic of China, which established itself in 1949 and until his death, after 1976, he became the, uh, the party leader and uh, many also accused Mao of, uh, of the similar autocracy uh, propounded by Stalin himself. Through the Chinese Civil War, he also uh, uh, gained the platform of the, uh, uh, of the Chinese Communist Party. But Maoism was uh, quite a different variety of the Marxism-Leninism that Mao Zedong, did, Ma Ma Mao Zedong uh, developed or propounded. Because uh, he actually realized that a socialist revolution in the agricultural and pre-industrial society of the Republic of China uh, would be completely a different project. And hence, he updated and adapted the Marxist-Leninist model to the Chinese conditions in which revolutionary praxis is primarily, uh, is, is primary, is the primary important thing and the ideological orthodoxy becomes a secondary thing. So the ideological orthodoxy becomes a secondary thing because uh, in the Marxist, uh, uh, in, in the Chinese terrain, uh, the major most uh, 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 exponents of Maoism were agrarian, where basically agriculture labor. So uh, for uh, Maoism, uh, uh, the revolutionary praxis becomes primary and the ideological orthodoxy, other shodhanata, secondary one. And he employed the Marxist-Leninist idea into the Chinese model. Uh, Qing dynasty, the Potuner Pore, Japanese occupation of China, like a Pratihat Pore, at the government formed Pore China, 1958. the great leap of Mao, the great leap forward from an agrarian society to uh, a, a, a form of industrialized uh, uh, society. Marx, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Mao Zedong to Igor And uh, the, the consequent Sino Soviet split occurred in 1956 to 1966 after the death of the Stalin. There occurs a clash between the Premier Nikita Khrushchev's policies of. There occurs a conflict, uh, the Sino Soviet conflict in 1956 to 1966. Uh, it arose from the ideological clash between the premier Nikita Khrushchev's policies of the de-Stalinization and peaceful coexistence with Mao's uh, uh, Stalinist policies. And uh, uh, there are many ideological differences between Marx and Stalin. Marx talked about a proletarian revolution, uh, but uh, a proletarian revolution by the industrial laborers while uh, Mao Zedong talked about a revolution by the agrarian societies. So there are many ideological differences. I will not go into the details of these ideological differences because of the lack of the time. What I can say is that the transformation of Mao Zedong into a cult personality, into a very uh, uh, controversial and autocratic figure also occurred in China. And this is perhaps a very recurrent pattern of, uh, of, of Marxist world history. In fact, uh, 
Charu Mojumdar and others uh, in the Nokshalbari village of West Bengal, uh, the, the, in, the, uh, the, uh, uh, in the North Bengal uh, in 1967 got inspired from uh, Marxism. So the historical dissolution and collapse of Marxism occurred when there occurs a dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991. The collapse of the Soviet Union was the process of the internal disintegration within the Soviet Socialist Republic from USSR, it changed into Russia. And on 25th of December, a very important day, 1991, a very important day uh, in the history of the world and European Marxism, the Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, the eighth and the final leader of the USSR, had resigned and declared his office extinct and handed over its powers including the control of the Soviet uh, nuclear missile launching codes to the Russian president Boris Yeltsin. And this is uh, actually a picture where we can see that the, the Soviet pre-revolutionary Soviet flag uh, 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 was actually uh, 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 the Soviet flag was actually lowered uh, in the Kremlin for the last time and replaced with the uh, pre-revolutionary Russian flag that evening around 7.32 p.m. the Soviet flag was lowered from the Kremlin for the last time and replaced with the pre-revolutionary Russian flag and there occurs the collapse of uh, Marxism, the collapse of the communism uh, uh, formally occurred on 25th of December 1991. So, why uh, many people discuss why that uh, Marxism failed in the political sphere? Well, uh, Marxist prophecy of the inevitable revolutions in the industrialized countries of the West proved incorrect. The middle classes have grown hugely affluent, which has been predicted had been predicted by Marx uh, in a different way, rather than being squeezed into poverty. So there occurred a, 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 a necessity of a new theory, a new theory which will address the lacuna, uh, uh, the, uh, the limitations of the Marxist philosophy. And it is uh, Antonio Gramsci, another Italian Marxist, who is a very important fountainhead and figure in the uh, Marxist literary theory. He talked about uh, and critics about Marxist economic determinism and he for the first time talked about the importance of the culture, cultural hegemony. So the failure of the Marxism actually uh, 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 props up uh, the question of the limitations of Marxism and uh, uh, Antonio Gramsci can be regarded as a post-Marxist, can be regarded as a neo-Marxist thinker who for the first time offers an alternative uh, viewpoint of Marxism. We will discuss uh, Gramsci's theories, the godfather of the cultural Marxism, as well as the Marxist literary theory uh, in my next classes. So my this present class basically discussed about the historical uh, background as well as the political history of Marxism from Lenin, Stalin to Mao Zedong and others, uh, Fidel Castro and others. And I have talked about how there is uh, always the dangerous potentiality of Marxism trans of transforming itself into autocracy. Actually, the history of Marxism has proved it. In the next class, uh, we will discuss Antonio Gramsci, the godfather of cultural Marxism, and how he confronts fascism head to head. So, till now, goodbye.